on camera. Today's September 30th, 2019. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center. And with me is Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. Uh, we're honored to have with us today Mr. Bill Coleman, William Robert Coleman, who is a veteran of the United States military, served in the Army, and he's agreed to come and tell us the story of his military career and his life in conjunction with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Mr. Coleman, we really appreciate you coming in here today, and we're looking forward to hearing about your military career and your, your life. Thank you. Could you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently live? Yeah. My full name is William Robert Coleman, and I currently live in Jonesboro, Georgia. Okay. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born April 8, 1947 in, uh, at Good Samaritan Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, my family and I lived in uh, around about 23 miles northeast of Dayton in a really small uh, city, or actually town. And uh, the big city next to where we lived was Lewisburg, and that's about 1,500. And that we lived in West Sonora, and uh, there were three stop signs in West Sonora. <laughs> I went back in 85, they removed two of the stop signs. And, uh, uh, and then we lived there until my mother died when I was seven. And after that, we moved uh, uh, to Chattanooga, Tennessee. My, my father was born in Ringo, Georgia. And uh, so we moved back to uh, Chattanooga. And I lived there until, uh, <clears throat> until I went to uh, college. Uh, and I went to North Church College in Delonica. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, so that's my... Did you have brothers and sisters? Or? I had five sisters okay. and uh, had no brothers, and yeah. uh, my twin and I were last, last to come along. Yeah. Had your father served in the military at any point? No, my father had not. And many years later, I, I found out only an uncle had served uh, in the military, and he never talked about it. But okay. uh, uh, my father was, uh, uh, my father had TB. Okay. So uh, yeah. he was ill and could not serve during World War II. Plus, by that time, I think he had about three or four children, yeah, so okay. he would have been yeah. probably last. Yeah. Uh, what were the circumstances under which you entered the military? Well, I went to North Georgia College, <clears throat> and that's a military college. Mm -hmm. and, but the circumstances, in my view, really started way before then okay. because uh, um, I was, uh, as a teenager, I was, maybe all teenagers are interested in war, yeah. and, uh, and uh, I played war a lot. Mm -hmm. um, then one of my uh, brother-in-laws had served in Marine Corps, and he, he'd tell me stories on that, and, uh, uh, and so I had an interest in the military. I was really gung-ho in junior ROTC in high school, oh. and uh, actually a high school classmate went to North Georgia, and uh, uh, whom I liked, uh, and uh, so I got interested in North Georgia because it was mm -hmm. a military college, yeah. uh, and I went there, and my friend left. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, uh, but I, I, uh, I was really interested in. Uh, Probably, I'm not sure that I was interested in military, but I think I was more interested in the ideal mm -hmm. of the military. And uh, unfortunately, ideals don't really sustain or yeah. last. But but uh, I, I had an interest in military. Were your parents okay with you going into the military? Uh, by that time, uh, both my parents were deceased. Oh, okay. and uh, But my family, uh, my sisters were okay with it because heck, one of my uh, sisters, her husband was in the Navy at yeah. that time. Okay. So there was no resistance on right. me going in the military. At, uh, at well, all. you've got a very interesting uh, bio as far as where you were. You served in a lot of places and a lot of different wars and conflicts. Yeah. 
Uh, sort of start at the beginning, uh, okay. when you first entered the military, and okay. tell us your story. Yeah. Well, I graduated from North Georgia in December uh, um, 1970. And, uh, two weeks later, 3 January, I reported to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, to officer, uh, infantry officer basic course. Mm -hmm. And went there, and uh, after that, I went to airborne school. And then after about four or five months, I had my uh, first assignment, which was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And what year was this? Uh, 1971. Okay. So, and, uh, uh, and I served in the 2nd 504th uh, Airborne Infantry uh, Unit. I had, had a weapons platoon at that time. And uh, uh, unfortunately, in my view, I didn't learn much about <laughs> about the weapons, but I later did, and uh, I, w I wish I'd learned more about the weapons at that <laughs> time. But uh, but that was my first experience in leading, leading, and uh, I'll try to remember later on the significance of learning how to lead. I was there about eight months, and then I got orders of Viet Vietnam uh, to go to uh, a Vietnamese language school in route. And then I went to Fort Bliss, Texas, to um, to Vietnamese language school, 11 weeks. But uh, about three weeks before the end of the school, uh, the war was drawing down, and uh, they diverted me from Vietnam to uh, Panama, uh, and uh, went to Panama uh, at the end of 1971, <coughs> and. Uh, Went down there and I had a, uh, a recon platoon uh, at first, and then after about eight nine months, I I uh, I had uh, I was changed jobs and uh, <coughs> had a uh, a support platoon. And that was 18 month tour, and after uh, 18 months, a, a friend of mine and I drove back from Panama. My friend served five tours in Vietnam. Wow. His first tour in 1962, and he and I drove back from Panama, and uh, uh, I was assigned to uh, to uh, Fort Benning, uh, Georgia, and uh, I had a uh, another platoon at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, a rifle platoon, and uh, uh, after a while they they needed uh, someone over at the mortar committee. Uh, and I, I went over there and I taught mortars uh, uh, there for, I, I, for some time. And uh, actually, last six months at Fort Benning on a 35-month tour, uh, I went to an uh, infantry officer advanced course. <clears throat> and then after uh, after finishing officer, uh, infantry officer advanced course in something like 1976, uh, I, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia to, uh, to uh, a supply management course because I was being assigned as uh, the logistics officer uh, in Korea at the Joint Security Area. And I went there and I served uh, there uh, for uh, for uh, a year, and then uh, after that year, I I made a mistake. I asked I asked the Army to send me anywhere uh, west of the Mississippi, <laughs> and they did. And uh, I didn't realize how how uh, close Fort Polk was to the Mississippi on the western side. <laughs> so they sent me to uh, Fort Polk, and. Uh, uh, all I could say about Fort Polk was <laughs> they sent me west of the Mississippi, <laughs> as I asked. And uh, by Fort Polk, I was served as operation officer for a, a, a maintenance battalion uh, for a little over a year. And then, uh, then I served at, uh, as a company commander in the uh, 3rd Battalion, 11th Infantry. And, uh, um, so uh, let me go into what I was talking about earlier on, okay. on uh, all that. So one of the major purposes 
I believe, and I've only come to believe this just recently, that uh, that it's such a privilege privilege of leading an American soldier. And luckily, I had five five platoons to lead uh, soldiers in one company to lead soldiers. And, and also in Korea, I had 500 people working for me as a logistics officer, 19 Americans, and the rest were Koreans. And uh, uh, on three compounds, uh, two of the compounds were within the DMZ in Korea. Huh. Uh, and I went in DZ, DMZ <coughs> every day. And uh, uh, so it's, it's just a privilege of, of leading uh, people. It does matter. It is very important to have good NCOs. I mean, if you don't have good NCOs, it's it's a struggle. Uh, or as they say in the army, it's a challenge. <laughs> um, it's actually like a like arranging deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, after after Korea and and Fort Polk. Uh, after Fort Polk, I went to uh, uh, Melbourne, Florida, and uh, taught ROTC. I was the uh, s uh, senior instructor uh, at uh, at ROTC at Melbourne, Florida, at Florida Institute of Technology, and uh, <clears throat> I took my job very seriously there because, in my view, the first three years and at at least at uh, FIT. Uh, it was just kind of getting the people interested in staying in the program. Uh, my job, as I viewed it, was to prepare them for uh, for active duty, and uh, I like to think I did okay uh, on it because uh, I was only there a little over two years, and and. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in the two years, uh, all of my cadets uh, uh, made commandant's list in their respective uh, uh, service schools. So I thought I'd done good. Uh, <clears throat> then after uh, ROTC, uh, uh, I went to uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I served at, uh, at that time the Army was having people serve in their, what they uh, called uh, functional areas at that time. And that was my first uh, assignment in the Army on the, my function area, which was was uh, uh, procurement. I mean, I had applied for all the good infantry uh, functional areas, but the Army gave me procurement, which turned out to be really good because not many requirements for infantry officers on the outside, a lot more requirements for, uh, for procurement people on the outside. So. I went to Fort Eustis, uh, Virginia, around 1980 to uh, to uh, serve as a, a contract branch uh, chief, and uh, we bought uh, <clears throat> we prepared contracts for uh, procurement of Army training programs, uh, which included correspondence courses, and uh, at that time called tech courses. Uh, it was audiovisual uh, courses. Um, and then uh, served that there until 1985, and then after after that I went to uh, to the Pentagon as a Inspector General, uh, and uh, served for only about uh, two months in the inspection uh, division, and where we did one big. Uh, inspection on uh, ammunition in the Army. But then they needed a procurement person in the investigation division, so I served uh, in the investigation division for 46 months as an uh, investigator investigating senior uh, senior officials uh, of the Army, and uh, only senior officials of the Army. Uh, and then after, after that I Came down down to Fort McPherson, uh, Georgia, and served uh, in the principal assistant responsible for contracting office, uh, and that was my last uh, assignment in the army. So, 
That's what I did in the Army, but I, I learned a lot of lessons, as I said mm -hmm. earlier, and, to, uh, and uh, only recently have I come to realize that uh, what, what privilege yeah. it was to, to uh, have, have tried to lead or lead uh, five platoons in, in uh, one company and, and the 500 employees in, uh, in Korea. I mean, it's, uh, the American soldier is, uh, uh, American soldier is awesome. Yeah. Uh, soldier better than any other um, soldier in the world. It's it's, it's kind of difficult leading them because of the independence that a lot of them have. But when they do gel into a team, uh, it's it's an unequal. Yeah. Uh, and and the independence. Uh, for an example, a friend of mine that I worked with uh, after I got out. Uh, oh, I forgot one thing. Uh, <clears throat> during my tour, uh, during my tour at uh, at uh, Fort McPherson, <clears throat> I also deployed uh, with the 24th Infantry Division in 1991 to uh, Persian Gulf for the Persian Gulf War One, and I served as a contracting officer for them, <clears throat> and then came back and retired. But uh, but uh, anyway, it was, uh, and the way I uh, came to realize that I think is very, very unique because when I was in the Army, when you led, you had green tabs. Uh, and I recently just dug out of my box the green tabs and then I put the unit uh, crest and I also have the cross rifles with the unit number on it and I put, put uh, Put them all on the green tabs I have, and then yeah. well, I said, "Whoa, wait a yeah. minute!" And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just glad I'm, I realized that, even though it's uh, it's late, because I came to realize that the reason I didn't realize it before is that old saying that you spend 95 percent of your time on five percent of the people, which is true. I mean, there's some people who are uh, not meant for the military, and uh, so anyway, I'm glad I, I realized it before it's my time to go. So uh, I think I've pretty well covered my military experience. Well, I think one reason the American soldier is exactly as you described is leaders like you. I oh, mean, thank you, you. you. You were in the military, but you led like you were leading a bunch of civilians that had a mission. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I tried to teach all my soldiers uh, responsibility and uh, uh, dedication. I mean, uh, quite truthfully, most of them, in my experience, in my view, most of them are already dedicated. Yeah. I mean, uh, they they honor the same things I yeah. honor the flag and. And more importantly, the uh, sacrifices that those of us who those who came before us yeah. made, yeah. so that we could be here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think that's inherent in the vast majority of the soldiers. And I, I, I do see it in some of the young people yeah. uh, outside of the military, yeah. but it just seems like it's more inherent yeah. in the military. And uh, one other thing, I remember Norm, Norman Schwarzkopf mentioning many years after he retired <clears throat> what he missed uh, in the military, and he said the people. Mm -hmm. And he was right. Yeah. I mean, you miss the people because the people are, are uh, an unusual group and a very good group, too. Well, I want to back up and ask you about a few things that you did and that you mentioned. Um, I know I saw on your DD-214 you went to jump school. Yes. Talk about that a little bit, that experience. Uh, that was a, quite an experience. I, I thought I was pretty good shape, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it changed from uh, World War II days because World War II days used to be five weeks and my, my experience was three weeks. <clears throat> but in the first week in 
in World War II was uh, weeding out of people. <coughs> and uh, the last day of my airborne school was they were weeding us out. And I mean, I just could not believe the, the pace they had uh, on the last run. And uh, uh, some people didn't make it, but luckily I made it. <coughs> and then, uh, then the second week is uh, what's called ground week. And uh, that's where they teach you go in, uh, in a different area, uh, teach you how to do uh, parachute landing falls, P PLF. And uh, at, at the end of the week is where you uh, jump from the 250 foot tower. And those are two towers down at Fort Benning uh, that were from a World's Fair, I think 1938 World's Fair. But they, uh, they lift you up with a parachute and then they release you and, and then uh, you have to land and uh, do a PLF. <clears throat> and then the third week is uh, jump week. And when I went through, unfortunately, uh, you have to do five jumps in a week. And, and they usually have it planned throughout, uh, throughout the whole week. And, but, but mine, mine because of the weather, they had to cancel. So we had, uh, uh, as I remember, two jumps, maybe three jumps uh, during one day, so that we could get yeah. all five in during yeah. that week. And uh, uh, and then they pin the airborne wings mm -hmm. on you and. Uh, uh, and it's a it's a it's a really uh, demanding actually it's demanding uh, very demanding course because of uh, of the uh, the physicality of it during the first week and and uh, uh, the PLF too because they have you jump off of a on the second week uh, jump off of a six foot platform to to uh, uh, to uh, practice P PLFs, and uh, and if you don't do it right, it hurts you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and also, you find out if you don't do it right in jumps, it hurts you too, but, uh, <laughs> which I did on many of my jumps, <laughs> stiffed up. But, uh, did you ever get, I, I noticed you do you did check that you had a service-related injury. Was that in connection with jump school? Yeah, I, had, I have a four crack vertebrae, uh -huh. and uh, that's from, from uh, jumping, uh, and uh, uh, at the t at the time I was so young. I mean, you're just gonna run, you know. <laughs> but uh, but it comes back to haunt you, and uh, uh, I mean it doesn't really hurt all that much. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, they are four cracked vertebrae, uh -huh. and it's from uh, what's called stiff landings. Uh, you tense up and you tense up and. Uh, Instead of your legs being flexible, it's tight, and uh, um, which is kind of ironic because one of the jumps, jump zones I jumped on was St. Mary Glees. And this year we've gone to uh, a lot of D-Day uh, activities yeah. and 75th celebration of, yeah. of things in Europe. We've been on three tours, really, uh, one on 6th June. Uh, for D-Day, and then uh, one in uh, one after that back to Normandy, but but then in August we also went to all that, and in all the tours we went to Saint Mary Glees uh, in France, and uh, it always reminded me of that one jump I had on. I mean, I had other jumps on other drop zones at Fort Bragg, but but uh, but Saint Mary Glees was unimproved and landed on a. a when, on a jump, I landed on a small tree that uh, it's about knee high, oh. and uh, although it was a small tree, but you know, when you land on a tree, that'd get your attention. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, partic particularly when your legs stiff. But uh, well, I just want to clarify something. You yeah. jumped St. Mary Glees. Is it, did you jump? I know sometimes at the various ceremonies around D Day. Yeah. Veterans will jump. Yep. Did you jump in St. Mary Glees? No, I wish, but uh, no, uh, it was St. Mary Glees drop zone oh, at Fort Bragg. I, okay, I thought that's what it was. I just yeah. wanted to 
But I, I wish I had. Yeah. Uh, we saw many of the jumps yeah. uh, on, during the week of 6 June uh, there. Didn't see the main one, but yeah. uh, where the uh, something like 11 or 12 C 47s. Yeah, that's uh, quite an experience watching that. Isn't it? it is. Uh, the drop that we saw was uh, British soldiers jump from okay. C 130. Yeah. Uh, I uh, talking about uh, uh, talking about. Uh, Jump school and jumping. Uh, I, I I jokingly say the first airplane I ever r rode on, I jumped out of, <laughs> <laughs> which was true. I mean, not many people can say that. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, no. You said you served on the DMZ in the DMZ in Korea. Talk about that. That was sort of a unique uh, yeah, it assignment. Yeah, was very unique. Uh, uh, a very demanding job. Uh, uh, like I say, I had 19 American soldiers working for me, and I had a total of 500 people working for me, oh. and uh, all the other uh, people were uh, uh, South Koreans, and uh, uh, very unique uh, assignment. Um, and uh, at that time, at that time, it's changed now, but at that time there was a, a camp called uh, uh, Camp Kitty Hawk, and it's right up against uh, the boundary, the southern boundary of the DMZ, and we were on a little hill. The concert hut that the officers lived in was built in 1953 uh. for the conferences that took place uh. at the DMZ. It was refurbished in uh, 1964. But we were there in 1977 and 78, and, uh, uh, and we had a little golf course, and on the other side of the golf course was landmines, huh. um, because, uh, and we had a fence around the compound, but, but uh, North Koreans were always in, infiltrating at that time, and uh, quite, quite truthfully, at many, many nights, uh, I heard firefights and going on, and uh, because within the DMZ there were two mountains, still are, the Collier and Olette. And at that time the second infantry division manned those those uh, hills and they had firefights at night. And uh, of course they were never recognized, uh, never reported really. Yeah. Uh, I mean I'm sure they were reported but okay another shooting. but. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't significant, is what I'm saying. However, uh, during my time there, there were several significant things that did occur. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, a a uh, CH-47 Chinook helicopter drifted into uh, North Korea, and they were shot down. Hmm. Um, four crew members, one was captured and four were shot by the North Koreans. And uh, <clears throat> four of the most intense days in my life were spent during the recovery of those four people. Uh, and well, bodies of three people and, and one. I mean, we had several uh, military armistice commission meetings. Um, and uh, it was just so intense because <clears throat> but because because about eight months before that had been what call, was called the axe murders of Panmunjom, and what the axe murders were about was uh, two soldiers, uh, one one captain and one platoon leader, first lieutenant, <clears throat> were there supervising what were ultimately become my Korean workers of uh, pruning a tree by a bridge called Bridge of No Return. And it's uh, the bridge that repatriated soldiers crossed um, from Korean War. And um, they were supervising pruning of the tree because it, um, another post uh, called OP-5, Observation Post-5, <clears throat> they couldn't see the bridge well, so that's why they were pruning the tree. The captain's, that was his fat last uh, official act uh, before he rotated out. 
<clears throat> and uh, there was a North Korean soldier who came across the bridge in no return and said, stop. And uh, the captain said, no, nah, go away. <clears throat> and then suddenly 40 others came and they got the pioneer tools from the trucks and jeeps that were on the U.S. side and started uh, beating the American soldiers who were around and uh, they ultimately killed the captain and, um, and the first lieutenant. And to me, the first lieutenant was the saddest story because uh, uh, he had run down to the gully between the bridge, uh, on the side of the bridge trying to escape and um, one of the North Koreans tripped him up and started beating him with a axe handle. And uh, apparently he got tired and so another Korean soldier came and beat him. And uh, with all the beating though, he was still alive until he was evacuated and he died on the way to the hospital. But, uh, but that was happened about eight months before. Uh, and this was actually on the South Korean side? They came across the den? It was within the Joint Security Act. Within the Joint Security Yeah, and okay. at that time, uh, uh, UN forces and Korean forces had uh, joint okay. uh, joint uh, posts yeah. within yeah. the joint security area. O year? Only within the joint security area. What year was that, Bill? Uh, 1978, I believe. Um, and uh, hmm. after that, it was only the uh, it was the first time and last time that Kim Il Sung apologized. Oh. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I got there six months after that, but but then shortly after after that, Chinook straight over in North Korea and shot down. But uh, did any did these get any publicity? Oh yeah, the Pam uh, the axe murders that Pam Jean did. Okay. Uh, and a lot of plug because uh, we came very close to World War Three, uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, uh, because what happened, it was happened before I got there, but, but uh, shortly before I got there, but uh, <clears throat> the second infantry division was, uh, was uh, alerted on alert. Uh, there's, at that time there was a battalion always north of what we called the M. Jim River, uh, and it was, which is, was a restricted area. Uh, and, uh, uh, there was one battalion, but they moved uh, one or two more battalions up there ready to attack. And, and they let the North Koreans know that we're coming to uh, uh, cut that tree. And the 2nd Infantry Division sent a, um, I think an engineer company, uh, into the joint security area and, and cut that tree down. and. Uh, B fifty B B fifty twos were hovering over North Korea, I mean South Korea at that time, so it, it became very close to yeah. World War Three. But like I said, Kim Il Sung uh, at that time, first and only time that he apologized, uh -huh. and uh, it was agreed to remove the 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 posts. I mean the North Korean posts uh, from. Uh, from the uh, uh, okay. south side yeah. of the MDL. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it, actually when I got there, we were still on alert. Yeah. And, uh, um, and so, I mean, you go into that <laughs> and uh, get the, uh, pardon the French, but you get the pucker factor real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you get scared is what that means. and. Um, uh, so, and then the Chinook was shot down and for uh, probably the most intense days of my life, uh, to include the Persian Gulf War, yeah. uh, and uh, it was just four intense days, and uh, I'll never forget, uh, last time, last time, uh, uh, well, I was, uh, everyone else was, I mean, the recovery was over and, and all that, and uh, we had some 
I always mess this up. It's PSP, which is metal plates uh, on the ground. We had a landing area on just outside the compound and um, with PSP. And, uh, uh, and they had a Chinook there to, to take the one surviving soldier uh, back and, uh, and the three dead soldiers. And uh, I don't know why, but it was very important to me to be there as, as they were loading the bodies and uh, getting ready to take off. And I saluted uh, as they took off. And uh, even brings emotion back today. Well, I understand that. But, but, and I'm sure the families appreciated all you and others did to get those bodies recovered. It was intense. And then after that, went to what uh, uh, what they called a monastery, and, and uh, actually we had had tours going up there, <coughs> civilian tours, and uh, <coughs> they went to the monastery, and there was a bar there, and we went to uh, all the officers were there at the bar, and not a not a word was said, and uh, we each had a drink, and then we drifted back to our yeah. respective areas. Mm and recovered during the day. And, uh, and uh, anyway, a couple, couple of times. In time. Actually, during my year there, we had more military armistice commission meetings uh, than, than uh, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And I, I just recently found out that they haven't had one in, golly, nine years. Huh. And uh, <clears throat> so it's just changed a lot. So. And uh, actually, uh, they changed the name of uh, the camp we were on to uh, Camp Bonifusis, and that was the name of the captain oh. uh, who was killed on that, that day. Mm. And uh, uh, so that, at least they're honoring him. And uh, I went to, uh, I think, the University of South Florida or, or a, a University in Florida, and uh, outside of the ROTC department, they have a, had a, uh, a tree uh, planted in the uh, lieutenant's name, oh. uh, Barrett, I believe his name oh. was. But uh, anyway, JSA was a very unique place. I had, I had, uh, I dealt with three unions, three civilian unions. Really, um, huh. had a fire station, had. Uh, had uh, <clears throat> uh, two restaurants. Uh, one one was uh, for for uh, Korean Army uh, augmentation to U.S. Army Contusa, uh, and one was for civilian employees. And <laughs> I, uh, I I laugh at myself sometimes because when I, uh, I I had to inspect it monthly, and when I first began inspecting it, uh, I was very uh, uh, I was trying to do the right thing. Well, the right thing for a Katusa uh, restaurant and the uh, workers' restaurant is not the right thing uh, for the Koreans. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I was in there for many minutes when I first started, and I don't know, after two or three months, I mean, I walked in the door, walked around, walked through the cooking area, and walked out. <laughs> 30-second inspection, and uh, <laughs> you know their health standards were very different than ours. But, uh, but uh, and uh, anyway, I mean, I kind of laugh at that. <laughs> but I mean, no one got ill. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, no lasting damage, huh? No. Yeah, and the saddest thing <clears throat> to me about uh, Korea uh, is that it cost me my first wife, oh. and uh, my first wife didn't couldn't handle the separation yeah. of the military, and uh, she she never, I mean, I remember getting a letter from her, okay, what's going on over there? Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of things you can't really, particularly in situations like that, you can't really share with your wife, yeah. or shouldn't. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, it was quite a, uh, quite of a, quite a, uh, 
experience. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely glad, notwithstanding the first wife thing, but uh, I was extremely glad I was assigned there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say it's a gift that keeps on giving because it, yeah. when I, I left, I got seven, seven, something like 17 gifts. And uh, like you get a flag that sat on the military armistice <coughs> commission table within the JSA, yeah. uh, within Joint Security Area. Let me back up and say, within S Joint Security Area, there's five buildings. Uh, and you may have seen it on TV when yeah. Trump stepped across yeah. into North Korea. <coughs> the extreme uh, right one is a North Korean building, and that's where they rest. Uh, next one is the, what's called the joint, uh, when I was there, uh, called the joint duty officer. And they're usually a Navy officer who was, meets with the North Koreans every day. And, uh, and that bill. The third building is the, uh, <coughs> is the uh, Military Armistice Commission meeting building. And then the fourth and fifth building is where the uh, Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission offices are. And at that time, when I was there, for the North Korean side, it was Czech and Poles. They since dissolved, since they dissolved as a country, yeah. uh, and, you know, at least on the communist side. And uh, on the UN side, it was Swiss and Swedes. They're still there. Um, so uh, those were the five buildings, and uh, um, and anyway, it's uh, it's very unique. But one of the biggest decisions I made when I was there, uh, they're all painted blue, UN blue, and I got this frantic phone call one day um, because I was having the buildings repainted, and. Uh, um, what, what color should we paint the door on the north side? <laughs> I said, well, what color is it now? Light green. He said, well, paint it you in blue. <laughs> and, uh, all that, so, uh, <laughs> the, the, now, I mean, I, 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 I like to think I accomplished a lot there. Uh, I mean, uh, I did a lot of people things, like, like I gave all the, all the Koreans, uh, uh, they never gotten this. Uh, when they had a birthday, I, I gave them a, uh, a birthday card. And uh, uh, most most units in Korea at that time only maybe had eight um, eight uh, workers. I had sixty five, and, uh, <clears throat> and it's just a unique unit because. Uh, most of our money came straight from Eighth, Eighth Army. I had small amount coming from uh, coming from Second Division, and actually I tried to get rid of that two hundred thousand from Second Division because it was such a pain. Uh, but eight hundred thousand from Eighth Army. I mean, if I needed any more money, I just hey, I need more money. Okay, <laughs> and uh, all that. But I I like like to think I accomplished uh, a lot of things up there. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of work, work-related things. I mean, like, like, I mean, we put in concrete pad around the gas uh, pumps we had. We had, uh, we had general officer cars. I mean, we had all kinds of vehicles, general officer cars, and at the gas station, and uh, put concrete around the gas station. Built a uh, a sauna room off the gym, and uh, uh, did a lot of other other projects. Uh, uh, probably more than more than uh, more than uh, others. But uh, well, what you did affected a lot of people, made their lives better. They did, and I'm sure those one thing that was a lasting impact is on the Koreans that you gave the cards to. Yeah. I mean that. They probably still remember that and I, made like a good impression of Americans. Yeah, I like like to think they did. And uh, uh, but the people who worked for me was uh, very kind to me when they left. They uh, they gave me a a, a Korean service medal, oh. which I couldn't wear as mm -hmm. on the U.S. uniform. But 
uh, anyway, it was uh -huh. they, it was quite an honor. And, yeah. uh, but uh, but and like I said, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. I yeah. mean, seventeen gifts when I yeah. I left from the Neutral Nation Supervisory Commission, and I mean, everyone was very kind kind to me when I left. Uh, workers. Yeah. Um, and actually, still get keep on giving because uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, I got uh, some more gifts from them. And uh, uh, well, they obviously respected you and the job you did. Yeah, I I like to think they did. I I did the best I could, although personally, it cost a lot. Okay. One other question before we move beyond Korea: Do you know if we ever recovered the well, let me phrase it a different way. Do you, do you know if the member of the Chinook crew that crashed was ever repatriated? Was he released? Or oh, you, yeah. He oh, was, okay. All four. There are crew members, and all four, uh, all four were, were returned to us. And, uh, okay, I'm, so by all four, you mean the ones that survived? No. Uh, no, okay, because the, there were the Chinook had four uh, four crew members. Okay, so yeah. three of uh, how, how many were shot? Three were shot. Three were shot. Yeah, and, and one had okay. had, uh, had bullet holes on the back. Uh, okay, uh, and and one was alive. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, no, there there's a crew of four, and all four were returned. And uh, uh, I kind of regret one thing because. Uh, because I uh, I owned the tree mm -hmm. when the tree was cut down after the axe murders uh, I owned the tree yeah. and uh, I mean I just I mean I get phone calls on, out of the blue I mean hey, can I have part of the tree and uh, huh. I don't know I just I I it was irritant yeah um, uh, to to have someone yeah. call and ask for that. And I finally talked to the commander and said, hey, can I, can I cut this up? Yeah. And uh, because it, it was on the back of the compound under tarps. Yeah. Uh, and I, he, he said, yeah, go ahead. But then when we recovered, recovered the dead uh, uh, aviators, uh, mm -hmm. they had put them in pine boxes. <clears throat> and uh, I, I talked to the commander and said, I don't want to hold on these trees. So I had some of my uh, American soldiers and I went on the back of the compound to, uh, to uh, 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 burn them. Yeah. And uh, one of the sergeants was working some of the nails out. And nails are very unusual. They're, they're not like U.S. nails and there's a kind of wide at the top and pointed at the bottom, kind of like old timey nails. And he was working, and I said, I don't want any of that. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, he got some souvenirs. No. And, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, we burned, burned yeah. them. But, but that, I yeah. think that answered your question. We recovered does, all, the whole does. crew. Okay. Talk a little bit about your service in the Middle East. You know what you observed, what you, what you did. Just any, anything you'd like to share about that, because that's still obviously a, a hot area now. Yeah, sure is, and probably will be for yeah. uh, probably forever. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Middle East, I think, is still fighting the Crusades, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and. Uh, um, Unfortunately, there's a lot of radicals who don't re read the Quran. I've read the Quran and uh, all that. But my, my service in the military in the Middle East uh, was uh, I was contracting officer for the 24th Infantry Division. And uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Saddam moved into uh, Kuwait. Um, Something like uh, something like the twelfth of August, nineteen ninety, uh, and um, 
we started deploying immediately, and I was in Saudi Arabia on August 15th. Of uh, 19... Pardon me? Of what year? Of 1990. Uh, okay, you were there in 90, okay. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and uh, shortly, shortly after Saddam had... Yeah. Had uh, all that. We were uh, in uh, in uh, da, da, uh, Damam, not Damam. That's the port near us, but Daharan, uh, and we were in a uh, how, uh, office building that, of a unit that was previously in. It was a support unit within uh, previously in in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, you submit them, and uh, um, and we we were there and establishing what later became what's called our uh, and that was the major support uh, unit uh, for for the whole war, and uh, 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 Pagonis was the general in charge. He was actually the uh, this. Uh, this log at, at Fort McPherson, and he deployed on the 12th uh, with uh, some people from me. We got there, and we were basically organizing uh, to to uh, to support, to provide logistic uh -huh. support to the incoming soldiers and uh, uh, and all that. So. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, we went, uh, we went on what I call the pre, pre, pre advance party for the twenty fourth because we were only the first five soldiers from the twenty fourth to be there, yeah. and uh, uh, we got there and I, I started buying things. Most most of the things I bought were were really just uh, uh, water. Was a was a very important thing uh, to buy. Ice was another important thing because although it was hot in Georgia, <laughs> in the twenty fourth it was deploying from uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, but uh, it ain't nothing like the desert. Uh, you know, I mean, desert you get uh, one hundred thirty degrees and and uh, during the day and at night. You, if you're not careful, you die from hypothermia because it's cold. Uh, and we went there. Uh, we got there. I started buying almost immediately. And uh, after the soldiers started arriving, it was mostly water and ice and, <clears throat> you know, support things. And uh, uh, since the war had not begun, they wanted a lot of a lot of <laughs> cars, and so we got a lot of cars, and two, in my opinion, too many, because I kept saying, well, this is a heavy division. You know, a heavy division not only has tanks, they have a lot of vehicles, uh, and we're, we're getting all kinds of uh, civilian cars, mostly for the leadership, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, as I remember, uh, General McCaffrey, who was the division commander at that time, had something like two, two cars. I mean, what does he need a car? Or two cars. But uh, anyway, uh, it was it is what it is. And uh, we stripped actually stripped uh, Saudi Arabia of all the cars that they had. And uh, uh, but then as the force uh, started arriving. Uh, we we leased uh, an area for uh, what was the initial assembly area. They the, they had the soldiers of the 24th come in. They'd put them there for a couple of days, and then and then take them out to the desert. And uh, 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 it was just a massive buildup and and all that and. Uh, a lot of difficulties in that area because uh, the, one of the issues I worked was I was trying to get a uh, couple of 10,000 gallon bladders of water so that the transportation company 
was not having to go 300 kilometers a day one way to get water for the division. But I was never successful on that, and, uh, and, and then the war began. And, uh, uh, and then they just had to go further than 300 kilometers. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, one of the most memorable things I did there was uh, the aviation, aviation battalion, uh, not battalion, brigade, was uh, way up north. Out in the desert, so I don't know what town they were near. But uh, the brigade commander one day flew down to Daharan to to uh, bring me up to where they were, so that I could negotiate with the local prince uh, to uh, to pay for the water that he was providing to the aviation. Uh, battalion. So uh, that was uh, I actually I talked to the operations officer on the way up. I said, you know what, the brigade commander's flying me? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, it's that important. <laughs> and uh, so so out there you, you uh, get concerned about the creature comforts. And uh, the creature comforts ain't, ain't that much for uh, American soldier, but you know you got to have water uh, out there, and uh, uh, if you can get some little bit of ice, that's good too. Sure. And uh, so, anyway, a lot of a lot of good memories from there, but it was also demanding. Uh, it sounds like you had some dealings with the locals. The, I did. The people. Talk about that with the cultural difference and everything. Oh, going it's on. very. Very different, and uh, and uh, very very different uh, different mentality. I mean, I I saw uh, a, a, I guess he was a sheik because he had a had a, he drove a Mercedes Benz in, in the United States. Uh, that Mercedes Benz that he was driving it was ninety thousand, um, and I saw the man get so happy for for something like I've forgotten really small amount because at that time we were only leasing a small amount of his his land uh, and he got so happy over I don't know ninety thousand dollars you know yeah. I mean ninety thousand dollars wouldn't even bought his car yeah. um, so it's it's uh, it's a different culture yeah. and uh, and actually uh, 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 Saudi. Saudi uh, Arabia, uh, Saudi guy explained it to me one time, and I'll, I'll explain the Saudi guy in a minute. But his explanation was that they're traders. They don't build things. They don't make things. They trade. So just a different mentality, uh, all that. And the man who told me that, I, I, I actually, when I was teaching ROTC, I was also going to school for, uh, at that time, my second master's degree, and uh, uh, later I got another master's degree, degree from Florida Institute of Technology, but, but uh, he was a, a Saudi Arabian Air Force colonel, uh, and he and I had classes together in procurement, and, uh, uh, and he's, he's the one who explained that. Huh. But it's a, just a totally different culture and uh, um, and uh, uh, very religious, and they have to be religious in Saudi Arabia because they have two of the largest uh, Muslim sites, Mecca and Medina, uh, in Saudi Arabia. So they have to be very, very conservative, and uh, and all that. So uh, yeah, a different culture, yeah. different culture, but but. Uh, but uh, I initially had some difficulty, if you want the truth, because of the different culture and uh, uh, because they they like money up front. Okay, are you going to deliver your product or not? And I had to learn that. And I mean, I, one of the scariest things I ever did was I gave 
a pharmacy. Uh, they wanted masks for, for you know, you know, out in the desert on those tanks that kicked up a lot of dirt, and they wanted basically surgical match, match, uh, masks, and uh, I contracted for one, and uh, I contracted for some with a uh, with a pharmacy downtown in Dharan, and. And I, I thought he was going to deliver them, so I gave him eight thousand dollars. And oh, oh, we'll get it, we'll get it. And I mean, I, I was scared to death. He did deliver, and uh, but uh, but I mean, and then after that, I learned okay, you know, we get the product first. Yeah. Uh, so it's a different culture, yeah. and different, uh, different, uh, very different. Had a real education over there, didn't you? It did. I did. I did have a very real education and uh, and all that. And actually, when I was over there during Persian Gulf War One, I, I didn't remember what what my f Saudi friend had told me that uh, you know the trading culture and uh, <clears throat> and all that. But uh, but no, it's a very different culture, and uh, uh, it's best to. Uh, Pay attention, <laughs> because they will, and they uh, they're out to make money, yeah. and uh, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. Don't get me wrong; it's not bad. But <clears throat> but but uh, they might tell you something today, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it's you know, different. Uh, now, was that your last assignment? And you know what were uh, uh, well, I was uh, actually my assignment at that time. I was stationed uh, at Fort Polk okay. uh, with uh, at the principal assistant responsible for contracting, but I was attached. I got you. okay to the twenty fourth because at that time the army, uh, <clears throat> the Air Force has a really good system, and the Air Force system is that, that officers and enlisted, and a lot of the times enlisted in the Air Force, but that's what they do, procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time, in the 90s, 80, 80s and 90s, in the Army, uh, the procurement contingency, it's called contingency contracting. Uh, the contingency contracting was not a uh, mature function in the army, I think it is now a mature function in the army, but uh, it wasn't mature at all. So I mean, they had a very difficult time in finding uh, procurement officers to support uh, the deploying divisions. Uh, and like like me, uh, when I went there, I, I came from the parks office. Uh, <clears throat> but also assigned there was uh, 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 another major uh, from the 24th, and his functional area was procurement. So he never had any experience in it. But but <clears throat> but he was functional uh, procurement. Uh, and then I had a, another major uh, working with me, who was an uh, inspector general at Fort McPherson. So uh, the contingency contracting function in the Army at that time was not very mature, whereas in the Air Force uh, it is very mature. Yeah, yeah. And the Navy was, uh, was very mature, m mature, but the Army, our yeah. Army, we didn't, you know, we didn't do that. When did you leave the Army when you discharged? I, I retired January 1991 after 20 years. Okay. So I came back from Persian Gulf and retired. Talk a little bit about what you did after the military, what the adjustment was like after 20 years and, and what, what you did and anything about your family. Or. The adjustment was very uh, hard for me after the military because at, at when, I, when I left the military, with the exception of two assignments, uh, one assignment uh, when I came back from Panama and at Fort Benning, I was there for 35 months, four different jobs, but 35 months. Um, and uh, then my assignment in the Pentagon was four years. 
But other than that, I was I was moving every year, every two years. Yeah. So when I first got out, I mean, I hit the two year mark uh, <clears throat> here in in Georgia. And I said, okay, it's time to move. Uh, but you don't do that a lot in civilian life, and um, so I had had quite an adjustment on that aspect. <clears throat> but I was very lucky when I uh, when I retired. Um, I got a, a procurement job at uh, Lockheed, uh, and uh, I, I worked at Lockheed uh, initially, and, <clears throat> and then they had a big layoff in '93. And unfortunately, uh, I was one of the ones laid off. I went back in '94, uh, and then in '95 they were uh, talking about another uh, layoff. And I looked around, the same circumstances existed uh, in 94, oh, well, 95, and that existed in 93, and uh, I'm not going through that again. So uh, so I left and actually went back to Saudi Arabia, and uh, hmm. I was a uh, contract administrator slash uh, deputy program manager huh. <clears throat> for a, uh, for a, uh, for a Saudi contract uh, that supported the Saudi Ordnance Corps in Riyadh, uh, and uh, more exposure to the different culture, uh, but more detailed exposure <laughs> to the uh, different culture. In, in what way? Um, a, a lot of ways. I mean, uh, um, I mean the. The, the we uh, friend and I would go down to the malls and and uh, the women were all oh. masked and wearing a bed and yet they're looking at uh, at sixteen hundred dollar dress oh. you know I mean very fashionable dresses and then okay so under that that mm -hmm. black robe is a sixteen hundred dollar dress yeah. I mean that was uh, always unusual <laughs> to us. And uh, <clears throat> another thing, we, we went to a store, we called it Kmart, but uh, it was just a big, big discount store, and uh, <clears throat> like Kmart. And, uh, uh, but then around prayer times, uh, the religious police would be chasing people to go to, go to uh, mosque and, uh, and, uh, Things like that, and uh, toward the end of my time there, uh, uh, the king had had ordered uh, Saudiization. Uh, that means Saudis, you have to go to work, because before that, uh, the government paid a lot. I mean, and uh, uh, it was the riding on the bus between our compact in downtown Riyadh is <laughs> an interesting <laughs> trip, trip, but, uh, but uh, they, they don't drive well. And, uh, uh, and uh, just the disparity, yeah. I mean, uh, just the disparity, uh, uh, like on Western compounds, and we did not live on the Western compound, uh, you know, people wearing shorts, and, mm -hmm. uh, women wearing shorts. Yeah. And, uh, had bacon. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> outside, you didn't have bacon. Yeah. Uh, even though in our compound uh, dining facility, you didn't have real bacon. Mm -hmm. You had uh, had uh, sheep. Mm -hmm. It was like bacon, yeah. but it wasn't yeah. real bacon. Uh, uh, and I mean, it's just this disparity. On the Western compound, you can go and order drinks. Yeah. Can't do that. At, uh, at our compound, although they did have a drink that I never, I had one sip and that was the, called Siddiqui. My friend is, is what that means and, uh, uh, and it's horrible, it's really horrible. I mean, I, I saw a guy, <clears throat> he lived actually in, in Saudi uh, family, uh, you know, welfare housing, six rooms. And uh, the government provided houses for the Bedouins. Uh, you know, they come and live in the houses for 
I don't know, six months, and then they go back out to the desert, and then they come back and all that. But he rented one of the downstairs apartments, six rooms, and it was horrible. <clears throat> and I'd go over there occasionally, and he drunk a lot of Siddiqui, mm -hmm. and and sugar would be coming out on his forehead, and mm -hmm. it's, it's horrible, mm -hmm. horrible stuff. I I only had one sip, and that was that was it. But uh, uh, so the disparity. Uh, the yeah. second time this, I saw the disparity in in life, yeah. and uh, now if someone had caught caught him, he he would have had to pay a big price uh, for that, <clears throat> and uh, all that. And then uh, you know, I just the I don't know, I just the disparity. I mean, for an example, hospitals. Uh, they they took care of the whole population on hospitals, but uh, but uh, you soon learn that some hospitals are better than other hospitals. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, like a guy who worked for me, a Saudi who worked for me, his, his father was uh, some like a major general, retired, but he went to the military hospital, and they they had first class treatment. Princes had first first class treatment. <clears throat> but everyone else, no. Mm -hmm. They 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 had medical care, but it's not first class treatment. Yeah. So just the despair. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, big big not it's not a disparity like in other countries, you know, the haves and half nots. Right. Although that exists. But uh it's just you know, I mean just I don't know. Big Disparate. difference in the way. Hmm? Big difference in what they have access to, depending on. Yeah, depending on their on situation. Their yeah. yeah, and uh, and all that. So uh, that's that's one of the things I learned yeah. during the second yeah. trip. And uh, the biggest thing I learned uh, during the second trip is I ain't never going back there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I mean, I have, I had difficulty with the disparities, yeah. and uh, uh, like I was watching 60 Minutes last night, and they had uh, uh, Prince Consul on, and uh, the interviewer was asking him about, uh, uh, apparently, uh, some of the women who had protested the most about driving and other liberalization, they're now in jail. Uh -huh. And he was saying he didn't know anything about that, but, but, uh, yeah. and he was saying, well, that's up to the court system. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> is it or is it? Yeah. Not? Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he said it was, but I'm not sure it is. And uh, they don't like dissent. And uh, uh, makes you appreciate this country, doesn't it? Uh, there's a lot of other reasons to appreciate this country <laughs> too, but yeah, and that's one of them. Uh -huh. uh, so. After you left that position, uh, I, I came back uh, and then uh, actually I was going, uh, <clears throat> actually I was just going through D.C. Uh, uh, to visit a friend and uh, a friend said, okay, hey, my company needs some people um, for, and we're creating a, a team uh, in my company. <clears throat> the name of the company is MPRI. They've since changed the name of the company, but it, it used to stand for Military Professional Resources Corporation. But uh, at, when I worked there, it was just MPRI. And uh, something like 19 four-star generals were associated with it. And actually, the president of it uh, was ex-chief of staff of the Army, <clears throat> Vono. And, uh, uh, I mean, general officers were everywhere, and uh, and we were. Uh, he was actually creating what's called the activity-based costing uh, model team, and uh, I was hired to be part of that team, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, I worked there two years, and we went to, around to different uh, military bases and uh, did. Uh, did uh, activity-based costing models, and uh, the biggest one I remember is is at uh, Edwards Air Force Base uh, in California. In Lang the nearest big city is Lancaster, California, 
but that's 40 miles away. But, uh, but uh, and then Fort Riley and, and several other, and, and Fort Bragg, I mean, uh -huh. several other places we did uh, activity-based golf scene models. And I did that for two years. And then after that, I uh, changed jobs and went to work for another company up in D.C. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, something like 97. And uh, uh, worked there until, until uh, me and my wife got married. And she lived in Suffolk, Virginia. And I lived in Alexandria, Virginia. And we figured it wasn't good to be separated, so uh, so I quit my job and and uh, moved down there. And <coughs> and Suffolk was not for me. It's a very small city. Uh, and uh, anyway, we talked, and anyway, she finally got a opportunity here in Jonesboro, and, sure. and we took it and moved down here. Good. In 2001. Sure. Sue, do you have any questions? Want to take a break? Not a break, but uh, just see if you have any questions that you want to ask. Just one. You mentioned driving home from Panama. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been interesting. <laughs> it really was. It, it was really, really interesting. And uh, uh, the friend who drove. Uh, he drove a Land Rover because uh, he had served five tours in Vietnam, and then he actually he had come from Vietnam to Panama, and uh, and all that. And so his first tour was in 1962, and uh, uh, obviously the last tour was something like 1971. But uh, but uh, he he was in a different battalion, but uh, but he and I knew each other and. Drove back, took 14 days, and uh, when I signed in uh, into Fort Benning, uh, the uh, personnel person said, "Took 14 days? <laughs> Usually, it takes only a few days." I said, "Yeah." We drove back and uh, had a lot of adventures happen, uh, uh, and uh, as we entered Costa Rica, uh, landslide had covered the road, so we had to wait a couple hours before they cleared that out. <laughs> In El Salvador, uh, he picked up a soldier out and walking along the road, and put him back, and and uh, soldier had a forty-five and, and uh, M1 uh, M1 Grand rifle, and uh, <clears throat> they don't issue blank bullets down there. Uh, and actually, after after the soldier got out and said, "Hey, Pete, don't ever do that again." Because they don't issue blank bullets, uh, <clears throat> but uh, it was safe. And then uh, I, I, just a lot of uh, adventures. And uh, uh, Pete and I still talk, uh, uh, actually, a couple of times a month. And uh, going back to Korea, Pete, uh, even though Pete Pete was only about three miles uh, uh, south of me in Korea. At Camp Greaves, and, but he's still north. What's north of the Imjin River uh, is a restricted area, and but he was still he was north of the Imjin River, but three miles. Of, and he and I were armed more. He uh, armed more in Korea than he he told me. He, both he and I were armed more in Korea than he was in. His five tours in Vietnam. Gosh, uh, and, wow. uh, But uh, anyway, Pete and I huh. came back, and uh, uh, it was quite a quite a trip. He uh, he basically uh, at, on that trip he he drove up Panamican Highway uh, on the south side, and about two years ago he left, and and we got off of it in San Diego, and he. Uh, Started in San Diego and went all the way up to the end of it in Alaska about oh, two years ago. Gosh. So uh, he travels still a lot. Okay. There's a lot more adventures I could go into. <laughs> uh, uh, we I, we, we uh, went to Managua shortly after the uh, something like uh, 73 
Berkeley. And uh, <clears throat> I have a picture of the U.S. consulate, which was uh, <clears throat> seven stories, and it's about three feet high. Mm. Uh, and, uh, at, at, and yet there's a, a cathedral there, 1600s or something like that, and wasn't even touched uh, on the earthquake. But, uh, and he had a friend, he had a friend there, and uh, there, and <clears throat> we bummed around with him. But <clears throat> I actually, not too long ago, asked him what, <clears throat> what, uh, whatever happened to his friend because. This this was before the uh, I've forgotten the man's name, but he's actually the leader of Nicaragua now. But uh, but at that time he was more socialistic, communistic <clears throat> than he is now. But uh, but um, he doesn't know whatever happened to his friend. Wow. Quite an adventure. Well, your your life has been an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, but, uh, is there anything else you would like to say in closing or, or anything that you didn't talk about that you want to talk about or anything you want to say before we yeah. stop? I, uh, I like to reemphasize what I uh, <coughs> said earlier that I just, I think recently uh, it just came home uh, more. Uh, and the, the way it came home was uh, I was I dug out the you know, the uh, when you're in leadership role in the military you wore green tabs <clears throat> and for some reason I got in my head well I'm, I'm gonna get the green my green tabs out and and put the crests and I I didn't know at that time I had the cross rifles with the number of designation of the unit but uh, it turns out I did. But I got the crest out and I put it uh, on the f tabs and put it on my desk in my home office. And uh, but it hit home on uh, what a privilege. Uh, and I wish I'd known at that time. But uh, uh, it, but it is such a privilege to to be able to have the opportunity to lead. Uh, an American soldier, and even the bad soldiers. I mean, you you do what you got to do to the bad soldiers. And unfortunately, during the time I was leading, for the most part, not not everywhere, because again, I said this earlier, because it really depends upon your NCOs. <laughs> uh, you spend a lot of your time on the bad people, the few bad people, <clears throat> and not enough time on the good, many good people. And it just hit home when I took the unit crest and the desi uh, unit designation cross rifles out and put it on the uh, green tabs that I wore and put it out on my desk. And uh, actually, I, I looked at them this morning and it, it hit home again. And that, uh, what a privilege it was. And I regret not being able to realize that during the time that I was in those roles. And it's just the American soldier is uh, is uh, unbelievable uh, soldier and person. I mean. Uh, I remember in RTC some uh, instructors, uh, all the instructors had just come back from Vietnam, uh, and one of the captains, Captain Cole, kind of like my name, uh, was talking about an action that he was involved in Vietnam and uh, and uh, his uh, joining company. All the officers were killed. Uh, the company was being commanded by an E-4, and uh, they were very successful uh, in that engagement, and uh, so uh, anyway, I kind of regret that, but but I'm just glad I came to realize uh, real, realize that before uh, 
before I leave. And uh, I cannot emphasize, overemphasize that. Uh, and the uh, vast majority of people in the world, I believe, are, are really good people. But there are not some that are not. And uh, so I'm glad I realized that about the American soldier. Well, that's a wonderful statement. and. Uh Obviously, you were an outstanding soldier. I know you retired as a major, I believe. Yeah. Is that true? And, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, I think one reason you were, were so good at it is not just your innate qualities, but you had sort of always wanted to be a soldier yeah. and be in the military. And you, you fulfilled that dream and obviously did an outstanding job. I mean, your people respected you and the just the story you told about some of the people in Korea, the locals, that showed their recognition of what a good person you were and a good leader and has to feel about as good as anything anybody could have done for you. And um, I mean, your leadership and, and the experience you've had in life, going to all these different places and meeting so many different people and seeing different cultures and, and um, the influence that had on you and then influence you had on them is something you should really be proud of. And we want to really thank you for coming in here today and, and uh, thank you for your service. Okay, thank you. Can I add one, one yes, thing? Yes, sure. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, most significant sayings that I've heard, uh, my, wife, my wife and I are, we're doing a lot of 75th celebrations for uh, World War II, I mean, 6th June at Omaha Cemetery, uh, another tour on all the beaches, and then <clears throat> the 75th uh, liberation of uh, Paris, and uh, all that. And she's watched uh, Band of Brothers a lot, and that's probably why I'm here mm -hmm. now. But, but uh, <clears throat> the, there's a saying in one of the episodes of uh, Band of Brothers. And uh, one of the soldiers from Easy Company says uh, one of his grandchildren asked him if he was a, a hero during World War II. And he says, uh, I was not. I served with some. <laughs> I did not think I would get that emotional, but that's such a a, a, a wonderful saying. And, uh, and thank you for your kind words for me. But I think I think the kind words are for people who served with. Me. Well, I I can't think of a better way to end this discussion and again thank you for your service. Well thank you. Thank you. Yeah thank, thank you for your time. Today. Thanks.